of Patriots History of the United States, Chapter 5, Part 7. Republicans versus Federalists. These fierce disputes created a political enmity Washington and others sought to avoid. Two vibrant, disputing political parties instead of consensus. Although Republicans and Federalists of the 1790s may appear old-fashioned in comparison to modern politicians, they perform the same vital functions that characterize the members of all modern political parties. They nominated candidates, conducted election campaigns, wrote platforms, pamphlets, and newspaper editorials, organized partisan activity within the executive and legislative branches of government, dispensed patronage, and even conducted social events like parties, barbecues, fish fries, and so on. Unfortunately, some have overgeneralized about the parties, characterizing them as rich versus poor man's parties, big government versus small government parties, or even pro-slavery and anti-slavery parties. The truth is much more complex. The Federalists and Republicans were closely related to their 1787-1789 Federalist and Anti-Federalist predecessors. For the most part, Republicans were more rural and agricultural than their Federalist opponents. Whereas an Alexander Hamilton would always be suspicious of the masses and their passions, to the Republicans, Honest majorities, unmolested by priests, quacks, and selfish deceivers, necessarily would make good decisions. This did not mean that all Republicans were poor yeomen farmers, because much of their leadership, for example, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, consisted of affluent Southern planters. At the same time, affluent merchants and entrepreneurs led a Federalist following of poorer, aspiring, middle-class tradesmen. Because the northeastern part of the United States was more populous and enjoyed a more diverse economy than the agricultural South and West, this rural-urban dichotomy tended to manifest itself into a southern-western versus northeastern party alignment. Characterizing the first party system as one of agrarian versus cosmopolitan interests would not be wholly inaccurate. Ideologically, Republicans clung to the anti-federalist, radical Whig embrace of small, democratic, decentralized government. They accepted the Constitution, but they read and interpreted it closely. Strict constructionism, with special attention to the first ten amendments. In this spirit, they retained their suspicion of direct taxation and standing armies. In foreign policy, they were naturally drawn to the radical French revolutionaries. Federalists, on the other hand, continued their drift toward a policy of expansive, vigorous national government. Certainly not a monarchy or coercive state, but a government that nevertheless could tax, fight, regulate commerce, and provide Hamilton's revered general welfare for all Americans. Federalists wanted a viable army and a foreign policy that courted New England's foremost trading partner, Great Britain. Members of both parties strongly believed in Republican government and the division of power. Both aimed to use the Constitution to govern fairly and avoid a return to authoritarianism. And both ultimately rejected violence as a legitimate means of achieving their political goals. While both groups feared tyranny, only the Federalists thought it likely to come from the masses as easily as from a monarch. With Adams arguing that unbridled majorities are as tyrannical and cruel as unlimited despots. One supremely important issue was missing from the list, slavery. It would be hard to claim that the Federalists were anti-slave, especially with slaveholders such as Washington at the helm. On the other hand, it would seem to be equally difficult to paint the small government Republicans as pro-slave. Yet, that is exactly the direction in which each party, respectively, was headed. Because of their view of general welfare and equality for all, but even more so because of their northern origins, the Federalists laid the framework for ultimately insisting that all men are created equal, 
and that included anyone defined as a man. Under other circumstances, few Republicans would have denied this or even attempted to defend the pro-slavery position. Their defense of state rights, however, pushed them inevitably into the pro-slavery corner. How to recognize a 1790s Republican or Federalist. Leaders of the Republicans were Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Gallatin, Clinton, and Burr. Leaders of the Federalists, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, Morris, Pickering, King, and Knox. Origins, Republicans came from the anti-Federalist faction of Revolutionary Whigs. The Federalists came from the Federalist faction of Revolutionary Whigs. Regional demographic base. The Republicans were based in the South, West, and Middle States. The Federalists in New England and Middle States. Local demographic base. The Republicans were rural, farms, plantations, and villages. The Federalists were urban, cities, villages, and river valleys. The economic base. Farmers, planters, artisan, and workmen were typically Republicans. Merchants, financiers, tradesmen, and some exporting farmers were typically Federalists. Class. Lower and middle classes, led by planter elites, were Republicans. The Federalists were upper and middling classes. Ideology. Republicans were radical Whig, localists, agrarians, pro-militia, less taxation, balanced budget, egalitarianism, strict construction of the Constitution, pro-French, and expansionists. The Federalist ideology was moderate Whig, more centralist, commercial, professional military, taxation and deficit, more elitist, enlightened paternalists, broad constructionists, pro-British, and reluctant expansionists. Future incarnations in 1980, the Republicans of that time were close to the Democratic Party of the 1980s. While the Federalists were more like Whig and modern Republican parties or the GOP. These are generalizations only. There are exceptions which nonetheless prove the rule. Sometime in the early 1790s, Madison employed his political savvy in officially creating the Jeffersonian Republican Party. He began his organization in Congress, gathering and marshalling representatives in opposition to Hamilton's reports and Jay's treaty. To counter the Hamiltonian bias of John Freneau's influential Gazette of the United States, Madison in 1791 encouraged Freneau to publish a rival Republican newspaper the National Gazette. Madison himself wrote anonymous National Gazette editorials lambasting Hamilton's three reports and Washington's foreign policy. He simultaneously cultivated national support, encouraged grassroots Republican political clubs, and awaited an opportunity to thwart the Federalist electoral dominance. When Jefferson resigned as Secretary of State in protest in 1793, The stage was set for the first national electoral showdown between Republicans and Federalists. It is true these were not parties in the modern sense of the word. They lacked ward, precinct, district organizations. Since voting was still the privilege of few, they did not rely on getting out the vote. The few existing party papers were not comparable in influence to those of the Jacksonian age 20 years later. Most important, these parties still relied on ideology, the person's philosophy or worldview to produce votes. Whereas the second American party system founded by Martin Van Buren and William Crawford in the 1820s was built on a much more crass principle, patronage. Still, these organs did galvanize those holding the franchise into one of two major groups. And to that extent, they generated excitement during elections. And we'll go on with democracy's first test in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Please click like, 
subscribe to the channel and leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.